Hi, I'm Blake Bettner, Managing Editor at Warren and & Wound, and this is the 2020 Virtual Wind-Up Watch Fair. Vare is a California-based brand that launched in 2015 with a collection of affordable, military-inspired timepieces that were designed to meet the needs of an active lifestyle. I recently sat down with Vare's founders, Ryan Torres and Regan Cook, to discuss their first dive watch. Here's our interview with Ryan and Regan. All right, Ver, welcome to the Virtual Wind-Up Watch Fair. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's yeah. great to be here. Thank you for having us. Uh, so maybe tell us, uh, start off, um, for those unfamiliar with the brand, tell us a little bit about yourselves, uh, your different roles within the company, and a little bit about the brand. Yeah, so I'll start with the brand. Um, we're Ver Watches. We've been around for um, five years now, since 2015. We make men's watches. We started with, you know, men's quartz affordable watches starting at $149. And our initial goal was to build a watch that both looked good and was durable. So um, when, when, when we started the company, we were actually working at a tech company together and I was surfing pretty often before work. And I found that the options for a surf watch, which I needed to tell the time to get to work on time, the options were mostly rubberized, G-Shock, um, Nixon, not really great looking watches. And then you had fashion watches in that, you know, 100 to $200 price point that weren't durable or water resistant. And so, uh, you know, I looked at the market and found an opportunity to make something that was affordable, durable, and you'd be comfortable wearing into the office. Um, and so Reagan and I worked side by side at that time and uh, he's a fantastic designer. So I kind of pitched the idea to him and uh, we found that we could make really great, durable, good looking watches. And so from there, we've expanded from that $149 quartz only option up towards our Swiss made automatic watches. And you know, the last five years have been a, a cool journey of discovering watches, learning a ton about watches and building some really great watches. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, and I understand that you've launched a few of your products uh, on, on Kickstarter. Uh, tell us about that experience. What was that like? Uh, what went into preparation for that? Um, so as Ryan mentioned, uh, you know, we started with kind of a humble beginning uh, in those early days, a $149 piece. We were both uh, kind of young, fresh out of college, uh, mid 20 year old. So we didn't have a ton of money. So to get the actual company off the ground, it was just our personal savings. Um, and, and I mean, if you look at, you know, the op watch we were offering at that time, the price point, we didn't really have a lot of extra margin there in terms of continuing to grow and expand the business. Uh, when we were able to continue to grow our quartz line, but it, when it came to launching a more expensive automatic, especially the type of automatic we wanted to do with the Miyota 9015 as well as with the Eta 2824, the cost of those movements and just in general the cost of production was so prohibitive that we really didn't have any uh, funding to do that. We could have gone with the VC route. Um, obviously, that's a common uh, tactic in this day and age with early stage startups. But uh, we had learned enough from kind of the tech world to know that that was maybe um, you know something that could come with a lot of uh, risks uh, and challenges as well. So we tried uh, to go you know a different lane, and that was this idea of crowdfunding. Uh, I think the benefit that we had in those early days was you know we had a small community of very um, happy customers, those that had backed our quartz watch, those that had been begging us honestly to create an automatic, and that's the last year in 2019. So we felt that we had a, a you know enough of an enthusiast community that we could launch something on a crowdfunding campaign like Kickstarter and at least not make it a total disaster. Um, as it turned out, it went incredibly. I think we hit our goal, uh, which was like forty thousand dollars within forty minutes. So <laughs> that was a great start to the whole uh, enterprise. And from there, you know, as these things often go in terms of crowdfunding, once you have a little bit of momentum on your side, um, you know, the the ball really uh, grows pretty quickly. And so for us, um, I think we ended up with you know hitting our goal. We we did like two hundred twenty thousand. Um, in 30 days. So that was fantastic and that was like kind of a lifeblood uh, for the company and, and for of course the automatic range and uh, yeah I think it's been a great success and it's allowed us to kind of hit that next level as well as kind of reach into that that segment which is kind of uh, the worn and wound community the hoodinkies of the world where um, if you're a watch brand and you're not making an automatic there's really not much interest so I think the automatic just kind of uh, kind of started a next chapter for our brand. Sure, that's a, what an incredible reaction to to, to the brand uh, there. So you mentioned uh, the surfing thing, um, you know, the, the going to courts from automatics. Uh, maybe tell us about some of the important features that uh, that Vera watches kind of embody and that you you see as important features for for the brand moving ahead. So uh, you know, when we started the brand, we had a, a list of like 
core quality features that every single watch needed no matter what. Uh, so the, the first one was 100 meter depth rating. That was what we saw as the minimum depth rating to have your watch usable in the ocean comfortably without issue. Um, and so we led with the 100 meter depth rating and that includes a screw down crown on every watch. Um, so we didn't find a push pull crown to be sufficient for that. Uh, all the watches have sapphire crystal. We now have variations of flat sapphire um, and dome sapphire. All the watches have screw down case backs. Um, so these were sort of the base core features. We also started with a Swiss quartz movement, but have since expanded quite a bit into um, you know, nearly every type of movement across our watches. But at the core of the brand was a durability weaved in with a nice aesthetic. Um, you know, we want to make sure that our users are purchasing our watches and completely comfortable using our watches in any outdoor environment. So something we use in our marketing uh, is the term waterproof. Uh, we don't call our watches waterproof, but we have a waterproof warranty guarantee. So I know in the watch world, a watch cannot be waterproof, but our warranty is a waterproof guarantee. So if a user has one of our watches and it fails within the first two years within their warranty period and their crown is sealed, we'll replace the watch. Uh, that's just how, how much we stand behind our watches and how confident we want our users to be using our watches in the outdoors. Yeah, and just to add on to that, um, I think for a lot of uh, you know companies, you know, waterproofing or water resistance is is a kind of an abstract. It's just another you know stat in the, that spec sheet. Uh, for Ryan and I, I know we're we're talking here for like less than a mile from the Pacific Ocean, and we're in the ocean every day almost. So to us, it's it's more than you know a talking point or a stat line. It it really just comes to like a real world functionality of you know the way that we want to use the product. So having that functional waterproofing is just really critical to our lifestyle, and we think that you know within the ad affordable segment, it's something that is obviously appealing um, to a lot of people. So yeah, yeah, I think a dive watch feels like a very natural and practical solution for you guys. Uh, tell us a little bit about the design, uh, where you kind of drew your inspiration from there. Yeah, I mean the first thing to say regarding the dive watch is you know, um, and, and we already mentioned this kind of talking about the starting of the brand is we wanted to kind of walk before we would, could run, um, and and that you know the dive watch is you know it needs to be done right. There's a little bit more uh, in terms of technical execution required. So obviously there's been a lot of successful brands that have launched with a dive watch. For us, we wanted to kind of make sure that we could figure out uh, doing a quartz effectively and kind of build into the automatic. So the dive has kind of been this. Um, kind of pinnacle, if you will, of, of a longer journey. Um, and, and I think we're, we're happy in many ways we waited. A lot of the things that we learned along the way, even regarding, say, American assembly, learning how to do that effectively and at scale, as well as just, you know, uh, improving dial, uh, understanding, um, you know, the many aspects of luminescent, uh, you know, crown action on that screw down crown. All of those things uh, contributed to us being more or less ready uh, to launch this dive watch. So it was a bit of a wait, uh, but now that we're at it, I think, I mean, the kind of the main takeaway is just continuing um, the core values of the brand, which is which is value at its very core. So, you know, our watch, I would say, our dive watch uh, is, is, I think, priced uh, very competitively. It's, it's kind of on the lower end of that price point. Um, but the way we see it and the way we kind of pitch all of our watches is we think it competes uh, effectively with watches two to three times the price point. Um, and, and, you know, that's just enabled by us being a small micro brand, um, you know, uh, selling directly to consumers and us just being the entire team. I think those are things that kind of embed uh, value into the watch. So I'll let Ryan maybe speak more to the kind of the bigger picture. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, uh, as you kind of said, a dive watch for us was a long time coming. My first watch that ignited my passion with watches was a Seiko SKX 007 dive watch, which is like the the, the North Star for a, a lot of uh, modern dive watches out there. And it starts a passion for, for wrist watches for a lot of people out there. Uh, and so over the last five years, we have been like slowly working our way towards this watch. As Reagan said, we can't emphasize enough when we release a watch, we want to make sure it's done right. So we've been, you know, building watches for, you know, this many years now, learning as we go, learning about the American assembly and bringing our assembly to the U.S. taught us so much about watches, watch design, and every little nook and cranny of where a watch could be improved. Uh, we've been working on this dive watch for almost two years now. So um, it's been going through iterations. We originally, I think, had a launch date of January or February of this year, and we kept pushing it back because we wanted to get everything with the watch perfect. And so that path towards making sure everything's done correctly, making sure everything's quality and making sure everything's going to last 
for a very long time was critical to us. Um, and another thing that's kind of funny that I like to talk about is as owners of a wristwatch brand, we only wear our watches. And so for five years now, we've been wearing only field watches. And so, I mean, you get the itch to wear a different kind of watch. This is the first time I've been able to uh, wear a watch with a bracelet on in, in many, many years. And so that yeah. also drove our, our design and production. It's like, hey, what's a watch we really want to wear? And, you know, a year and a half ago, two years ago, we were both like, let's, you know, we want to wear a dive watch. And, and so we built the watch that we would want to wear. Um, and yeah, and, and so in regards to, um, you know, the dial designs, we have uh, quite a few unique dial designs. I'll, I'll let Reagan uh, jump into that and ask, you know, you can go ahead and ask another leading question. Yeah, the other thing I would just add on to that kind of early stage or just the way we think about a new design, whether it's the diver or other models, is that, you know, and I think this is the case for a lot of uh, the worn and wound brands, is that, you know, as a micro brand, we don't have the luxury of, of a big, you know, conglomerate to launch a product that, that flops. Um, you know, that's our livelihood. We're self-funded. So if we have, if we put time, energy and investment in a product and it doesn't succeed and, and people don't respond to it, that might be the end of the company or it's going to, or it's going to severely impact our future. And so for that, that like uh, level of caution, uh, I think creates a lot of um, empathy, if you will, with, with the existing kind of enthusiast community. And the way that we've done that in the last two years is even pre-launch is to run a, like a long sequence of surveys, both with existing customers as well as just people that may be interested. So I think for the dive watch, we collected something of like 2,000 survey responses. That's like a 15 question survey. And, and we really did take those um, feed pieces of feedback from heart. So it's kind of, you know, the YouTube commenter community, the worn and wound uh, watch lover community. We really wanted to hear what people had to say. And we tried our best to integrate as many of those pieces of feedback and suggestions as we could. Because again, if, if we're listening to the community and building a watch that they want, then that gives us a little bit of peace of mind that this is actually going to be a successful product. Yeah, we know. We'd love to hear that. Uh, was there anything particularly surprising that stood out to you guys as a consistent theme? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, there's a lot of things. I mean, certainly, um, I guess one of the more interesting aspects is that, you know, it always, we always find interesting as, you know, with that design iteration, whether that was the automatic last year or the, uh, the die for this year, is that Ryan and I come up with kind of a, a core model or kind of a, you know, a North Star in terms of what the design um, may be. And then, um, you know, we kind of, not to say that we don't think the designs are great, but we're always cautious with that. We throw maybe, you know, five or six or seven more uh, designs out there and, and just in early, you know, uh, mocks, you know, whether that's like renders or just like even the kind of two dimensional uh, picture of what the dial could look like, just to, to kind of garner feedback and see where interest would be. Um, that's a way, and, and, and actually the case, the fact that we did five uh, distinctive, um, you know, dial designs for the diver, those were informed by, um, you know, the, the interest and kind of the voting of, uh, of this kind of the survey community. Um, I think one of the watches we sent to you guys, the Tropic design, was something that was was a little bit of a late addition, but but something we wanted to try kind of more unique than maybe you would say the rest of the lineup. And and that one got a really strong response, not only in the survey, but once we actually launched the watch, there were people that were putting the money where their mouth was and, and actually buying the product. So it's kind of nice to see that whole uh, journey and, and, and showing that, you know, if you actually ask customers what they want, in many cases, they'll come back and uh, and back the project. So that's nice to see. Also, just yeah. tacking, tacking on to that, uh, something that we found super interesting through surveying people is diversity of opinion. So like you, you want to look for or find a definitive answer. And oftentimes, you know, something like date, no date is almost always 50, 50 or exhibition case back versus solid case back really, really split. So it's just interesting to see. And then even when, you know, we throw the data into Excel and find, try to find patterns, you know, um, you have your ETA 2824 and your Miyota 9015, are some of those users going more towards exhibition or, or stainless steel case back? And all these things and finding out that everyone has very unique opinions, which I'm sure you guys see in the comments sections everywhere, is no matter the watch you build, someone's gonna have their own version of it that they'd like. And so we do our job, we do the best we can to offer a lineup that has two movement options, a ton of dial options, uh, date, no date options, so that people, while they can't design their own watch per se, there's potentially an option that fits their exact needs. And even still you find there are users who, you know, they're like, if you did this dial with the ETA and a date or a stainless steel case back, I'd totally buy it. So there's always gonna be edge cases, but it's just, it's really cool to see how everyone has unique opinions and people are very passionate about 
uh, you know, the case back or date, no date, or whether the date's at the three or the six o'clock position. So um, definitely yeah. cool to see that and interesting to learn that over time. The other only thing I'll add yeah. to that, which is just another insight, and, and this one actually might be a good insight for other, um, you know, watchmakers watching this video is that, you know, we've consistently surveyed about, you know, interest of American assembly versus Swiss made. Obviously, Swiss made is kind of the, you know, the top of the list in terms of, you know, what people would expect for quality. But we've consistently seen, um, you know, the offering of a Miyota with American assembly has always led um, in terms of popularity for our um, our customers, at least. And I mean, that may also have to do with a slightly lower price point. But I think it's something uh, worth considering for other manufacturers out there to say that, um, there is a there is a sizable community of, of, of watch owners that would choose American Assembly uh, over Swiss made, which may come as a surprise to some people. Yeah. So in, in, in considering the survey data that you guys had, um, did, did you ever find yourself at a crossroad of, boy, the data might be pulling us in this direction, but this is what we want to make, and we're going to put our foot down and do this because this is the watch that we want to wear at the end of the day. I mean, to be honest, we've been pretty receptive. We've tried our best to integrate like a diversity of opinions. Um, another one, Ryan mentioned a bunch of great examples of like uh, where, where the communities are split 50-50. Another one would be the kind of the use of, um, you know, a, a patina or like that old radium colorway. Um, you know, that can be a, a bit of a divisive issue and, and de determining, you know, obviously when we're trying to make a retro style watch, you know, that, that, that tanned uh, coloring is, is not original to the piece. Although those who are wearing a vintage piece maybe are wearing it because they like that tan color. But then there's other sides of the community that say, well, originally that watch was uh, done in white paint. So there's a different like uh, views of opinion. And I mean, I guess we've just taken the easy route out and tried to offer them in, in both white, <laughs> white and uh, in tan colorway. So we, we've just tried to make everyone happy to the best of our ability. I would say yeah. one, one feature that, I've, that we, we had a lot of discussion about was the solid case bag versus the exhibition case bag. Um, that was pretty split, and we know a lot of people who are really deep into watch, the watch community and, and wristwatches uh, may prefer a solid case back. To us, while we want to build a watch for a watch nerd, um, if, the, if the exhibition case back doesn't compromise the water resistance, which it's not even close to the bottleneck on water resistance, it's something we wanted to offer because we want Bayer to appeal to I'll use the term watch nerds again out there, but we also want Bayer to bring new watch owners and new, you know, new people into the watch world and, and, and start passion for those watch owners. And something like an exhibition case back is one of the coolest things. When I show our watch to people who don't know wristwatches at all and they flip it and look in the case back, it's like, it's like all for them. It's amazing. And so I think that's one of those things where you're going to get a watch with a mechanical movement. It's going to be less accurate and uh, it's going to take more maintenance than a quartz watch, which is a fraction of the price. That mechanical movement is the reason. And to be able to see it, I think, is pretty magical to a lot of users. And so that's something we, we did choose to offer, um, despite the fact that we know, you know there are watch nerds out there and watch aficionados who'd prefer a, a solid case back. The only other feature, yeah. too, I would speak to, um, and it comes to where, where maybe Ryan and I would draw a line in the sand is regarding, say, water resistance ratings. I mean, our divers are set at 20 ATM, um, and, and all of our other watches are set at 10 ATM. Again, both come with this waterproof warranty guarantee. So in that sense, even our 10 ATM watches aren't technically less waterproof than, than our 20 ATM because they come with the same standard. Um, but of course, you know, there's a community out there that wants to kind of push the limits of that. Obviously, there are, you know, the Rolex, I think, comes with 100 ATM or, or even some, some other brands do that as well. For us, I mean, as I say, Ryan and I are in the ocean all the time. We are going to be wearing this watch on our wrist, surfing or otherwise. And so for us, we kind of have that sensibility of, yes, we could make it 30 or 40 ATM, but that's also going to add weight to our wrist. It's going to add bulk. It's going to, you know, probably diminish the ability to do exhibition case back. So, so there's certain examples where we have leveraged our own experience being in the ocean and wearing a watch on our wrist, you know, for two, three hours at a time. And just knowing that at the end of the day, 20 ATM is actually probably the best fit in terms of offering a, a solid package. So that's, those are maybe some examples where we've um, kind of in, intervened in terms of other uh, pieces of feedback. Yeah, yeah, no, that's really cool. It makes a lot of sense. Um, and taking a step back and just to close, maybe we can kind of touch on your roots a little bit. Uh, 
tell us about the Dirty Dozen watch, anything that you got going there, and uh, maybe anything that we can look forward to uh, in 2021 for Ver. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we, we released uh, the Dirty Dozen original watch last year. That was the first time we worked with Warren & Wound. So that was a 40 millimeter watch with an ETA 2895. Um, it has the, the small seconds. And, um, you know, we wanted to build a, a tribute to the original Dirty Dozen watches, which were made in the 1940s. Um, they're, they're really incredible watches and it got the eye of a lot of people and they, we actually sold out of them. So um, we're, we're currently no longer producing that 40 millimeter. Uh, and we decided to, to re-release it. We wanted to make it more true to the original. So the, the re-release is gonna be a 36 millimeter case. Um, and we're using a hand wind at a 7001 with a beautiful, huge exhibition case back. Um, so it's really going to be a gorgeous watch uh, and, you know, that smaller, uh, more historical size. Oh, that's awesome. We'll look forward to seeing that. Um, well, on that note, uh, we will uh, look forward to seeing you hopefully next time in person at the next Wind Up Watch Fair. Uh, but until then, thank you so much for joining us. It really means a lot. Thanks. Good to be here. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Good to be here.